Tonight, we're very, we're, we're very fortunate to, have, uh, to be able to work with Universal of Waterloo. Uh, we have a great uh, Universal of Waterloo alumni who's going to be sharing uh, their entrepreneurial um, journey with us. Uh, let me quickly introduce you to uh, the people we have on stage. Uh, first of all, our moderator, Jason Chu. He's the uh, CEO of Terminus. One of the most amazing uh, marketing companies here in Hong Kong. And then we have Ted Livingston, uh, CEO of Kick. I think it just now he gave everyone an introduction of his company. Uh, messaging and gaming uh, uh, company. Uh, on my right here, we've got uh, John Baker, uh, CEO and founder of Desire to Learn, a platform with over 10 million learners. So let me, uh, let, let's give everyone a quick welcome. And uh, let me also hand the stage over to Jason, who shall uh, moderate uh, uh, for us. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you, Theodore. Hi, everyone. Hi. Well, I'd like to congratulate all the teams just now who did the pitches. Uh, I was in there, the last 15 minutes of debate and fighting among the four judges. Um, fantastic ideas, wonderful pitches, and the four judges all have different opinions, and eventually no casualties, they come to a conclusion, they don't know what the result is, but they have their own scores. Uh, everybody, all the teams, I think, are winners because those are really high quality, fantastic pitches. Even compared to those that they have seen, I think they would fully agree back in Canada. And I'm going to ask them how the pitches were done over there as well, because Waterloo is one of the most exciting startup community uh, nowadays in North America. So today I have two gentlemen here, two very different gentlemen, but equally amazing. Um, I'm very happy to say that I'm one of them because we are all alumni of the Faculty of Engineering from University of Waterloo. I'm not very happy to say that. Among three of us, I'm the Jurassic one because I'm, er I'm in my early 40s. This guy is in 20s, in his 20s, and he's in his 30s. All right, so a round of applause for, for the young entrepreneurs. Um, well, before I launch the questions at them, I'd like to say the most impressive things I learned from each of them. Uh, Ted, of course, this guy raised money and built an amazing WhatsApp equivalent messenger uh, uh, app. <laughs> it's called Kick. It never made a lot of money from that platform, but somehow a lot of users is approaching 100 million users. He has raised over 30 million. So I thought I raised 25 was wonderful. I'm invincible. Actually, he raised 30 just like this. Right? No profit. Great. <laughs> I need all of your help. So Kick is is more popular than WhatsApp in the United States, but not nearly as popular as WhatsApp in Hong Kong. So I need all of you guys' help. We gotta go go down Kick and start kicking some what's happening. <laughs> okay. Uh, advertising later. <laughs> And we have John Baker. John Baker is CEO of Desire to Learn. Uh, mo the most amazing thing I found about John with the limited you know, information that I've learned so far is that he actually didn't raise money. And he bootstrapped his company from day one and made it profitable since day one until he has 600 employees. And then he raised money recently. And the first round, Series A funding, 18 million US dollars. Guys and the money guy. Uh, successful guy. Yeah. Okay, so come back. Let's let's talk about you know how where do you get the idea of doing kick and you know tell us more about kick and your entrepreneurial journey. Um, sure. So uh, I went to University of Waterloo. I'm actually not quite an alumni. Uh, don't tell my parents. But I dropped out of my second to last term at university. Um, <laughs> but as part of my sort of journey, I worked at BlackBerry in 2007. And so I just got to like see mobile very early, and I was like, got pretty good at it. Got pretty good at it. My boss was like, oh man, tell you're good at this. You gotta go and start a company in mobile. So I actually, Kick originally started as selling music for BlackBerry, and that's where we started. We built this music service, and we were gonna integrate with BlackBerry Messenger. And 
And one day we realized this thing called the iPhone and later Android is going to be a big thing. And so we've got to put our app on iPhone and Android as well and show the BlackBerry Messenger, which we were planning to integrate with, to also be on iPhone and BlackBerry as well. Um, but so we go to RAM, we're like, hey guys, we've got to, you know, WhatsApp's coming out, Pink Chat's coming out, you got to take your app across platform. And uh, uh, they absolutely refused. Uh, so that's how we got into chat. We said, well, if you want to do it, we will. And uh, the chat part of it ended up taking it off. We shut down the music part and sort of the rest of the history. Okay. So, so you just left at BlackBerry and started your own company just like that? So I was, I was still in school at the time. Uh, basically, I was going into my third year. Uh, University of Waterloo and so BlackBerry was a work term? No. Yeah, BlackBerry. So at, at University of Waterloo, in order to graduate, you have to complete six four-month internships, uh, which is something that makes University of Waterloo really special. So it was on my fifth fifth term. I was working at BlackBerry. I worked at BlackBerry my third, fourth, and fifth term, and my boss said, uh, "You got to go start a company. Mobile, mobile's going to be big." And you understand it. So I went back to school and I started it while I was in school. So you you believe in your boss? What he, what he said to you. Did he put money in your business? He did not, but he gave me the best advice in my life. So actually, at the time, um, uh, BlackBerry actually wanted me to drop out and come on full time as a product manager. And I was excited to do that. I love BlackBerry. I'm like, yeah, I'm definitely going to do this. Uh, but he's actually the guy that pulled me aside. like, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Which, in hindsight, was fantastic advice. Um, and then, uh, he's like, go back to our company. That's what I did. So. Are you going to acquire BlackBerry? <laughs> Not yet. It's not good yet. It's not good. Okay, how about John? Tell us about your story. Uh, so, first of all, uh, those pitches were awesome. Uh, I've got an opportunity to see pitches in Toronto, Canada, the US, all over. I think you guys did an amazing job. I think you're on the right track for building some great businesses. So, uh, yeah, round of applause. <laughs> Kept being a little bit humble. When he, when he did his first raise, I don't know if you know this part of the story, but he actually donated a million dollars back to the University of Waterloo to support other entrepreneurs do startups. Uh, I promise to be similar when I do an IPO. Um, you know, for me, when I started that company, it was my third year at the University of Waterloo. Uh, again, doing co-op terms throughout was an amazing experience because it gave you an opportunity to really see a lot of businesses, get to learn a lot, and be able to apply that knowledge into a new new creation. And in my case, I saw Amazon changing how things were being bought. My dad was now buying stamps online. I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And then uh, what was amazing at systems design engineering at the University of Waterloo, uh, you do design projects every year. So first year was uh, designing some new laptop thing. Uh, by the third year, it was an open-ended design project where we were able to pick anything that we wanted to work on and come up with a really creative solution. And that sparked that entrepreneurial passion for me. So I looked at education, and I saw all these other industries being transformed by technology, and I saw it missing in education. So I looked at this as an opportunity to really take uh, the best of technology and really build a, a next generation learning platform to support millions of learners all over the world. And so started off with one person, two, I think there were two people when we did our first pitch, just like these guys did up here today. Uh, you know, it wasn't a pitch for money, it was a pitch for clients, uh, and just, you know, continued to skyrocket ever since. What is the scale of the business now? So uh, nearly 100 employees globally, uh, and over 1,000 clients, everyone from like Harvard to Waterloo to uh, you know, Singapore Manchuria University here in this region, hopefully a few others that I'm visiting <laughs> tomorrow. Uh, and even big companies now starting to leverage this technology to support a transformation of learning when you go into the workforce. Or uh, New York City rolling it out for 1.1 million kids across New York City. Uh, you know, it's, it's incredible because all of a sudden you're, you're seeing learning go from traditional face to face like we're doing right now to being online and blended learning experiences. So you're leveraging technology in that classroom and also to support fully online experiences or cool things like the tutoring that you're doing here today. Uh, but you're also seeing uh, education delivery and experience completely transformed. So in the past, you used to go, you probably still do, go through a textbook that's probably printed, that's going digital, and all of a sudden now we can make it adaptive. So each learner gets their own learning pathway through the experience, the education becomes personalized to them, and we can really make the experience more engaging. And to me, that's the exciting part. It's not just changing it to being using technology, it's really changing the actual activities themselves and the experience. It's going to really be transformational. Are you 
talking to any universities in Hong Kong? Yes. If you know some, like, we want to talk to them all. <laughs> uh, so, so tomorrow I'm visiting with City University. Um, well, I guess coming back to Ted, um, what what are the most important things for you in growing your business? And that two questions. The second is what's keeping you awake at night? So what are the worst fear if there is one? Um, two tough questions. Um, so I, I guess the, the most important thing for us and the part of life that I really enjoy about this is so we kick. Uh, it started off, you know, we the reason we picked music for BlackBerry is because. That was a problem we cared about. Um, you know, I had a BlackBerry. I love my BlackBerry. I love everything about my BlackBerry except for music. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> then I look at my phone with an iPhone. And I'm like, then yeah, I have to carry one device, and I have to carry a BlackBerry in an iPod. That sucks. I don't want that as part of my life, so I'm going to fix that. And that's sort of where it started. And it meant that I could, when I worked on Kick, Kick Music, I was working on it for me. And I knew that if I loved it, then probably other people would love it too. And that's progressed through the Kick Messenger. We built Kick Messenger for us. We wanted texting, but better with all these different features. And so when we get, when we think about what we're doing next, we're like, oh, wouldn't it be so cool if we could do this? That's going to be amazing. So really, what keeps it going forward is just having an amazing team that, that loves the product, loves the problem, and and just constantly wants to work on it, wants to win, wants to build the best product available on the market. Um, what keeps us up at night? Um, I don't know, it, like the space is definitely getting really crowded at this point. Um, <laughs> like, it, and it, you know, whenever you have, the, the size of the opportunity always matches the size of the competition. And now with messaging, you know, the opportunity here is to, to, to win the killer app of the mobile era. Same thing when search was to the internet era, same thing that what, you know, productivity software was to the PC era. Whoever wins this is going to become the platform uh, for mobile. Um, that's huge, right? Uh, the world's been mobile devices, and, and so we are we're competing with some of the biggest companies in the world at this point, and that's exciting, and that's scary. For the benefits of those who haven't tried Kick yet, what's the major difference in differentiation of Kick versus WhatsApp, whom everyone uses here? <laughs> so, all the messengers, at this point, there's sort of five big messengers left in the world uh, WhatsApp, Kikau, Wine, Quartian, and Kit. Um, and basically, all these messengers are, 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 are basically the same. You know, send messages to your friends for free, in groups, you know, pictures, videos, whatever. Um, there's only two things that differentiate the messengers at this point. One is, which ones do my friends already use? Here, my friends already use WhatsApp. In the US, my friends already use Kik. Uh, but the second thing, the thing that's unique with Kik is, what is my identity based on? So for WhatsApp, you sign up with your phone number. Right, you put in your phone number, it works like SMS, works like SMS, but it's free. And that's really great because it makes it really simple. Um, but what it means is if somebody gets your WhatsApp, they also have your phone number. And they can call you, and they can text you, and do all these things. With Kick, it's the only mass market messenger of those five uh, that uses a username instead of a phone number. And what that means is you're in complete control of your privacy. So like, you know, people use Kick to connect on Instagram, for example. Everybody uses Kick. What's your Kick? Here's my Kick. Kick me. You search hashtag WhatsApp, it's like 500,000 photos. You search hashtag Kick on Instagram, it's like 18 million. Um, so I think that's like the big thing that differentiates Kick. It's a little bit more complicated. Like, what's your username? How do I create it? But once you get over that, you get a lot more control. Um, so that's why people, you know, people basically connecting on Instagram and all these mobile networks all use Kick as well. John, what's important? What keeps you up at night? Uh, for, for me, uh, you know, we're in an industry that's not quite as far along as uh, mobile messaging. You know, we're at the very, very beginning of the transformation of the entire educational sector. Uh, and for me, it's how do I hire the best engineers and the best talent I can find globally to really ride uh, what's going to be the biggest transformation of the second biggest industry in the world. Uh, and you know, that's a huge challenge. And any little misstep could be could be treacherous. <laughs> And luckily, we built a really good business model that allows us to really uh, have a lot of sustainability in our business and then just keep going after the new, new wins, new wins, new wins. But the, the, the big one for me is just simply getting the horsepower behind the organization so we can go out there and get not just 10 million users, 100 million, 200 million, 300 million, and then maybe eventually one point, like, you know, a global learning platform for the world. So, so are you a service to Coursera? Or? So uh, we compete with Coursera. Uh, we also work with uh, universities directly. 
provide a different model. We look at we look at open courses as just a part of the integrated learning experience. So we look at it as just similar to like a textbook or similar to open content or going to the library. It is one of many resources you're going to use in your learning experience, whether you're in high school or university or you're off into the workplace. It's not one or the other. Uh, and so what we're doing with our clients is like Ohio State or Waterloo or others, where they're all opening up all their courses, is making that part of what they can do. Is this more um, tailored or geared towards the Western education system? I mean, is, is it market agnostic for what you're providing? Or, uh, or another question to ask is, how do you adapt to Asia market? So what's great about here in Hong Kong is you're using our uh, main competitor today, Blackboard. And I don't know how many of you use Blackboard in the room. It's like the legacy dinosaur in the US. Um, and so for us, you know, it's a huge opportunity for us to come in and provide sort of a next generation learning experience, be able to make sure that the students here in Hong Kong can actually have a better, you know, outcome, if you will, better grades, better results. We're closing attainment gaps for first generation students. It's really cool stuff. Uh, but we, you know, we have a huge challenge just making sure that we build up our sales force and our teams globally. So we've got big people in Singapore and in, uh, in uh, Australia. Where we want to look for partners and, and growth in, uh, in Hong Kong. And, and looking for partners, great, of course. What, what are your fears? Uh, other than uh, we've gone through lots of challenges like that has. You know, I don't, I don't fear those things anymore. Uh, my, my biggest fear is just instilling like the passion in our teams to really you know, uh, realize the opportunities that are there in front of us. Like, th this is a huge transformation and it's just beginning. And if we don't move fast, we're going to have like five or six other kicks chasing us. Uh, and we want to be out there uh, pioneering this and making sure that we've got the, the market leveraging our platform for them. Okay. And John, now you have seen how we've done it in Hong Kong, how we've done it in terms of pitches and startups in Cocoon right here. Now, I know both of you are involved in the startup community in Waterloo, particularly you. you uh, Ted has been the judges and I think one of the organizers behind Philosophy, uh, which is a startup community and they organize pitch days. I had the privilege in the summer, went back to Waterloo and I witnessed an entire day and it was as exciting, if not more, in their own way uh, over there. So I'm going to ask you, after experiencing tonight and doing what you're doing back home, what, what do you see are the differences in terms of entrepreneurs, uh, the community, and you know the whole ecosystem itself? Um, sure. So so in terms of like pitches tonight uh, specifically, like I we could be in Waterloo right now. This could be a pitch event in Waterloo. Um, you know, I don't feel like we're in Waterloo for pitching. You know, this could be Y Combinator. Um, I was really impressed with the quality of the pitches, but you almost gave me like a you know. Don't expect too much. Like you, you understood it. Expectation management. They were blown away. Um, so I think I think that's really exciting. Uh, I guess like the one thing I was hoping to see is, is I think like you know Hong Kong is one of the, the global centers of the world. Um, you know I was here in 2008 and I immediately went home and I took Mandarin lessons for the next year. So I'm like holy crap! Like China's going to be a big thing, and and Hong Kong is the best place to to jump into China. Um, and so you know this is one of the top global centers in the world, beside New York and San Francisco. I mean, Waterloo, it's like 300,000 people working on farm town. And so I I would just like you to to see you look at like global ambitions. Like yes, leverage your, the fact that you're in Hong Kong and you can do things here that require you to be on the ground in Hong Kong. And great, do that. But have have a vision and an ambition to. So once we win Hong Kong, then we're going to win Europe, then we're going to win Africa, then we're going to win the United States. And I think that's really important to, to have that global ambition. I, I think I would echo that. Uh, you know, I think uh, the, the one thing that I learned when I did my first pitch is the person that went on next after me was like talking about how big their market is in the U.S. And I went, the U.S., Canada is a small market. I think that should be about the U.S. Uh, you know, broadening that perspective. So being able to go out there and just not think about like a local market, but thinking about the global market, because the appetite for what I saw here tonight is global. Uh, and there's many you know, competitors all over the world trying to solve similar problems. And being able to think on that scale is going to become very, very important. And, and, you know, and, and I, I uh, chair Communitech in our community, which is like a, a tech entrepreneurship hub. And as I walked through and through the space, it, like, it felt familiar. Like you know, you've got EIR programs running, you've got 
you know, open collaboration spaces that people are teaming up around. Uh, you know, we should be doing a lot more to partner uh, between Waterloo and Hong Kong, and let's get some real business going. This, this shouldn't be just you doing it here and us doing it there. We should be working together to tackle these problems. Yeah, when I was there in the summer, I had one or two teams came up to me and say that, you know, they are wondering how to reach out to the Asian market, and perhaps there is a, you know, a space uh, that we collaborate together between Hong Kong and Waterloo. Um, well, I guess, last comment. What would you say is the most important thing in what's next for your business? What's the most important? You go there. No, you go there. <laughs> <laughs> you always get time to think about the question. Oh, I do. Oh, time, time, time. Uh, okay. So the most important uh, big step for us over the next little while is supporting both the enterprise positions, so working with directly with the universities, while at the same time supporting uh, the individual learner. So if we're going to build a learning set, a learner-centric, you know, uh, learning platform where the learners first and foremost, and then you've got, you know, your parents perhaps if you're younger, or your instructors, and then the university. Uh, but at the center of that system is the learner, and everyone agrees with that. But how do we balance that with the enterprise needs of the university or school or corporations? And uh, if we don't win that battle, this is the consumer space. Uh, we're going to lose the enterprise market as well. And so I, I think that's, that's, the, that's the one big challenge that we've got on the go right now. But we're doing some really cool stuff. So we've got a really cool app called Binder uh, that you download. It's free. We use it on you know, Facebook or we call it something called Edge Identity. But that's a, that's a first step to sort of like being what we call a hybrid type of app where we sort of cross both boundaries, enterprise as well as personal. Uh, but there's a, there's a lot more to be done. IKO? <laughs> You know, you you focus on building a great business. Like that that's what you should be doing. Like just focus on building a great business. And then if you know if, you know someone comes along and says, here's eighty million dollars to help you continue to fuel the cloud, awesome. You know, get those fires burning even hotter. But if someone comes along and says, you know, if there's an opportunity that pops up to do an IPO, great, but that's not why you do the business. Right? Like you like you guys have great missions up here. The mission should be like, I want to transform how people uh, do home automation with like and just completely change the game when it comes to electrical and heating bills. I don't know. Whatever the mission is, that's the mission. Like I watched the E and Y entrepreneur of the year do his little talk, and I'm like, this guy has like an awesome mission for yogurt. Like he's a yogurt company, and it's like an awesome like he's like you know we're changing yogurt. I'm like, okay. Um, if he can make a yogurt company have a cool mission, you can make any one of these companies really mission driven. And I think, like, the more that we get, sorry, that's no offense to the EY entrepreneur. Uh, <laughs> he's got an awesome company, and if you ever meet this guy, he's, he's very impressive. Uh, but the, the point is, you take that great little seed idea of going, it's not just about the money, that's a means to an end. It's what purpose? Why are you here? Why are you investing all your time? Why are you investing all your energy to really, uh, to really drive this world forward? Um, so yeah, for us, the big thing we're, we've been focusing on for the last three years is we sort of have this conundrum. On, on one side, you want to differentiate the product so that people say, oh, you should switch from WhatsApp to Kick for this. But on the other side, people want a very simple experience, like, oh, I just want to message my friends, I don't want anything else. And so the question is, how do you both differentiate but also keep it simple? And the answer we've come to, and we came to three years ago and Wine Cacao and WeChat, not WhatsApp yet, but Wine Cacao and WeChat have come to you since, is, is become a platform. Uh, so that you know now on Kick you can get this pure, simple messaging experience, but then, oh, maybe you want to play a game with your friend. And then, oh, maybe you want to shop with your friend. And maybe you want to share pictures with your friend. Um, so that's, that's the strategy every company has taken except for WhatsApp. Uh, WhatsApp is sort of winning right now, so they almost hope that they won and, and nothing could take away from that. Um, but for us, it's, it's okay, if you just want messaging, you have that. But if you want games, you've got to be on Kinect. If you want to share pictures with your friends, you've got to be on Kinect. Uh, so that's what we have now. And companies like Zynga exclusively launched their latest game on Kinect. So if you want to play Zynga's latest game, you have to get Kinect. Um, You're just saying, that download Kinect right now. So. Zynga has a great game. If you want to play, you have to get on Kinect. Let's the start of the revolution here. <laughs> So it sounds like some of the entrepreneurs here can actually create a business or create a product that 
you know, lives on or basically connects to K, which has 100 million ready users. They, they can also do it for D12 too. <laughs> so then you get 400 educational technology companies that are integrated into our platform, all through open APS. Uh, just, just saying, saying. Just, just saying, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> I've got a lot of advertising at time. <laughs> floor, questions from the floor, anyone? Opportunity to grill this to high flying Canadian entrepreneurs. Tell them this is Hong Kong. Anyone? Theodore, yes. Yeah. Oh, all right. What's your strategy for China? Okay. John, you want to answer that first? <laughs> uh, the, the question is what's their strategy for China? So, uh, right now, your strategy or my strategy? Both. Both are strategies. Oh my god. You can talk about it. So, uh, right now it's through partnership. So we've got uh, one person on the ground in uh, Shanghai that's uh, developing an understanding of the local market, that's really trying to build the right relationships and partnerships. But obviously then they need to expand. I, I don't think we're ready for uh, China in a huge way yet. Uh, we've got uh, small clients uh, in China. Uh, we've got US uh, entities like Harvard that are set up in China as well. Uh, but we, we really are at an early stage for uh, our Chinese strategy. The, um, you know, the platform's ready to go, the localization's ready to go, we just now need a, an entry strategy. I, I'm asking that because... Do you have an idea for us? No, I think uh, Chinese have uh, a lot of desire to learn. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> So it's funny for us, uh, there's actually a, somebody was doing an interview with a guy from Tencent and you know, oh you launch, you launch Wexan and it's so popular now, like what was the inspiration? And they actually said, it's like quoted in, in the media, actually it was when Kick went viral through China in 2010 that we knew it was time to build a messenger. So it's actually Kick was the inspiration for them to build the Wexan. And that, their, it, this is their quote. Um, but since then, like obviously, we, we always knew that like we were early and like we spread through China, but that we really didn't have a chance in the short term to compete. I mean, you know, Tencent has hundreds and hundreds of millions of people in QQ. They have hundreds and hundreds of local developers, thousands and tens of thousands of local developers uh, in China. And so for us, it was that's really cool, but in the short term, we're not deceiving ourselves. We know we can't compete in China. Um, that said, like you know, I think all of these messaging companies have global ambitions one day. Obviously. You know, one of the most important, if not the most important market is going to be China. And so that's trying to figure out how we sort of get strong in other markets and then leverage that either through partnerships or, or direct entering to, to get back in China. So you, you had judge at um, the Philosophy or the pitch day at in Waterloo. If we organize it through video conference and find mutual time, which is tough, but between Waterloo and Hong Kong, <laughs> can we do a joint? I get like midnight. Two. Well, it's either your midnight or our midnight. Or we'll take we'll take turns. We don't do early. As long as we don't do early, you guys. We'll do right early. All right. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we can give that a, a think and a shot. Any other questions? I just downloaded a cake. You gotta tell me your user ID in a bit. Um, <laughs> no, so I've got no friends on it. So my question is, how did you first get I mean, the most important part to get people to use it? Like, how did you do it? How did we get people to use it? How did you get it? Yeah, so first of all, my username is Ted. I got great selection right at the beginning. <laughs> There's now 100 million usernames that are all gone. Like, if you type in, you're like, take it, take it, take it. They're all taken. But I have Ted. Uh, TED, uh, so we message. But um, so really, what, what happened with Kick? Uh, the reason it took off is uh, two things. One is so we were doing cross-platform chat, iPhone, Android, BlackBerry, and up until that point, WhatsApp, and chat, all the other solutions, the BlackBerry app was just brutal. Like it was like you know three text boxes, like you know 1990s UI, and for us, we're like, well, we're all on BlackBerry and. We're going to have a damn good BlackBerry app, no matter how hard it is, because that's what we are going to use. And iPhone and Android were secondary. So the first thing was, we were the first chat app that had, had three great apps rather than two great apps and an app with the BlackBerry app. Um, and then the second thing is, we were the first company to use your address book to recommend new friends. So the whole, you know, you sign up, we put your address book, and we were like, oh, you may know this person, you may know that person. 
Um, and every, at the time, that was like magic. Like, you know, it's like, how is it doing this? <laughs> um, to the point where, like, it, it was great. The reason we, like, within weeks, like, every VC from all over the world was flying into Waterloo, this like, farm town, to meet with us because they get on and they're like, oh my gosh, all these, my VC friends are already on. Like, what is this thing I'm behind? And then but they tell their VC friends that they can feel early with their friends. It just looks incredibly crazy to visit the investor community. Um, so yeah, that's really what it was. Like, uh, an app with three big apps on each platform and then something novel with the, you may know from your address book. Um, it was just sort of like, it just went viral. It was insane. Like, like we, we launched it and it sort of like bumped along and we're like, okay, and then, and then you know, sort of seven days later, it's like, oh, we got a thousand people today, that's sort of cool. And then the next day, it's like, oh, we got 2,000 people today, that's sort of cool. The next day, it's like, we got 10,000 people, like, whoa. And then we're, like, the next day, it was like, we got 50,000 people today. Do we have enough servers? And, and literally, we, we uh, I remember that. Yeah, we, 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 we hit 300,000 people in one day. Uh, we literally had to like rent a private jet to fly servers into our database, because they're like, we're not going to have enough servers by Monday. So, <laughs> and we like, literally, like, there's guys running across the tarmac with like servers under their arm, like, putting them in, like, say, the keg and a half. So it just like, went crazy viral. It was, it was an amazing time. Yeah, I think it's a classic, you know, just focus on what you believe in, just do it, and then put it out there and see. And that works very well for you. And you get, you get lucky, I mean, like that was a year and 10 months after we started. Like we did music for a year, and then we did music and chat for eight months, and it wasn't until a year and 10 months in that this thing clicked. And everybody's like, oh, we're a success. And, but to us, we're like, no, we've been working on this for a long time. We've tried a bunch of different things. So just keep going, like something you love, and you know, when luck strikes, like run with it. Read the private chat by circumstance. Ladies and gentlemen, big hand for the. Oh. My name is Sam. I just want to ask a quick question. Uh, when you're at the beginning, when you're 8 million like user, 100 million user, 8 million love, but like, like investment is easy for you to keep the thing very excited. But when you're just beginning, you don't have much other than your mission statement and some shares more than I'm worth any money. Like, <laughs> how do you motivate your team and how do you uh, keep the good people together? Last question. Um, so I think like the, the biggest thing I recommend to people is just pick very near-term concrete goals. Like so for us it was okay, um, we need to watch this music app live within two weeks, no matter what, and let's get it on one blog. And so we did that, and we launched it, and we hit hit twenty thousand users, and it was just this like pure like a drive on the shop. We're like wow, that was amazing. What what's the next thing? And then so we picked another goal two weeks away, and, and we made that. And, and you know, sometimes you pick a goal and you don't make it and, and momentum comes down. But the job when you're doing a startup is just to always be trying to build momentum. And the way you do that is not, oh, let's build this for a year and then I'll launch it. But like, what can you build in two weeks? What can you build in two weeks such a, and what could you make happen with that such that if that happened, you would have moved forward. You'd be excited. Uh, so that's what we did at Kick. It's just two weeks at a time building momentum uh, until it was just like, at this point now, we've raised $30 million and it's, it's impossible to stop because that's ultimately is your biggest risk. Not competition, not running out of money. It's just stopping. You know, you're all excited. You work on it for a week. Every day you're working on it. And the next week, you know, maybe every other night. And then all of a sudden, six weeks have passed, and you haven't talked to your team at all. So in the beginning, just like make it, just build up. Okay, a big hand for uh, two hundred.